Hello and welcome to the Donahue Group. We're happy that you've joined us again for a half an hour of conversation, which we hope is both scintillating and informing, and if nothing else, just vaguely interesting. Uh, my, na my name is Mary well, Lynn Donahue, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if I get that right, I'm going to go on and introduce uh, Cal Potter, former state senator and uh, assistant superintendent at the Department of Public Instruction, Professor Tom Paneski at mathematics professor at the University of Wisconsin Sheboygan. Thank you. And I'm, whatever else you'd care to add to that <laughs> is just fine. And Ken Risto, a social studies teacher and, and yet someone with a, a higher position in the Sheboygan Area School District, which is? I am a curriculum and assessment specialist. In the social studies area. In the area of social studies, yes. Yeah. Well, very nice. CAS. They should make you wear ties. Not CSI. Don't you? I think uh, it was 84 degrees in my classroom today, and I have a rule: once it gets past 82, the tie comes off. Well, so. very good, <laughs> fair enough. I'm human. <laughs> Isn't it something about teachers, though, that you know you just find them constantly complaining about? I'm <laughs> <laughs> merely reporting conditions. <laughs> um, we're uh, talking a little bit about life uh, in the state of Wisconsin. It's been, uh, in some respects, a little quiet. Um, I have not seen the ads uh, attacking Governor Doyle. Uh, Cal, you indicated that you have. Is the political season starting? Obviously, it is starting early because we know of at least two challengers uh, to, uh, to him in uh, 2006. So it is a long political season. What are the ads? Uh, well, they're, they're, the, the premise on both of them is that the website at the end is sick of high taxes or something like that, dot com. And both of them are using issues which are hot button. One is illegal aliens going to university, and the other is uh, gay benefits, medical benefits for gay couples. And they throw those in there as distasteful, you know, issues that they want to affiliate uh, Governor Doyle with. At the same time, saying, "Well, he's raising taxes to do this, or fees to do this, and so on." So, I think there are two agendas here. One is the bu budget bill is going to come out of the finance committee and be voted on by both houses of the legislature, uh, sometime in about two weeks at the most, and they're setting that uh, stage for fighting any fees or tax increases that might be proposed or be in that document. And the other is, of course tarnish the governor's reputation for next year he's up for re-election. And so the sooner you start to do that, the greater chance somebody's going to hear about that negative aspersion that you're putting forth and the, the better chances for defeating him next. So it's a conservative movement, anti-tax, anti-Doyle type of uh, a movement. And uh, I think both ads are very despicable because of the fact that they really do associate issues which are quite dissimilar and really are insulting. If I were a Hispanic person, I would have been highly insulted by the ad uh, that they had this Hispanic lady talking about how she was a legal immigrant and so on. Um, it's just, it just was completely distasteful, in my opinion. It's interesting to me. I, I had uh, read that Doyle's approval rating is very high, um, well above 60, well, I shouldn't say well above, but at least 60%, uh, which. Uh, I guess surprised me just because it's a fairly rugged row to hold mm -hmm. on the state level these days. And whether you're talking about property tax freezes or saving $3 for a, a homeowner or $10, there's still the perception that the government is too big, taxes are too high, and, and so forth. But Doyle does seem to be doing a lot of things right, uh, at least uh, if this poll would be would be a fair mm -hmm. reflection. I, uh, it'll be I interesting. I think he's created a very moderate Democrat image. Um, I think very much like uh, Bill Clinton did, uh, middle of the road. Um, if you talk to liberal uh, folks, I think they thought that Jim Doyle had a, would be a more liberal governor, and I think uh, there are people who, who uh, think that uh, he hasn't been as friendly to state employees, for example vowing to cut 10,000 positions in his first term. Uh, those folks are not happy. Mm -hmm. So I think he's made some uh, traditional sort of liberal constituencies uh, more unhappy. And I think there are some people, the majority of whom are in the middle, I think, politically, um, see him as a governor who's trying to do a difficult task at a difficult time with a difficult legislative situation. He's got both houses Republican. And really, that state Senate is really a conservative group. Uh, well, Assembly isn't much different, but it, it is, it's not just Republican, it's a conservative uh, uh, Republican uh, majority in both houses. 
Tom, you're our token Republican. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what, what's your sense of how Doyle is doing and how he's playing around the state? Oh, I, with the uh, proposed, uh, I, I, from one, one thing for Doyle, I hope he vetoes the UW-Waukesha, UW-Milwaukee kind of study. Uh, he, I think he said he would. So I would be, I would be for that. Why don't you tell our listeners a little bit more about this is the merger of the systems? Well, the Joint Finance Committee, and there was a resolution uh, that they adopted to have a study of combining the UW-Waukesha, making UW-Waukesha more like a satellite campus of UW-Milwaukee. Right. The UW-Milwaukee chancellor is uh, kind of going away from the previous chancellor's emphasis on making Milwaukee an urban city. He wants to now make Milwaukee competitive with UW Madison, and somebody proposed that we we disband the UW colleges, and then that got narrowed down to maybe just Milwaukee and UW Waukesha, the UW College at Waukesha be become merged with uh, Milwaukee. So if Governor Doyle vetoes that study, uh, that would be uh, crucial to the UW colleges uh, keeping their two-year mission of educating people at the home, mm -hmm. at home, alive, because the UW-Waukesha is the UW College's biggest campus, the largest campus. Uh, so I would support that. Uh, as, far, uh, as far as uh, other issues, uh, I didn't like uh, Doyle's idea of rating the transportation tax for a lot of funds, uh, the transportation budget for a lot of funds but to but support McCallum programs. Uh, much more blatantly to the so you kind of it, it's a constant argument you know you, you you raise the gasoline tax automatically every year and then you ra it's supposed to go for streets and roads and everything else and then it gets used for something else and so it's not like being out front with what you're actually mm -hmm. doing so and I haven't seen the ads so I have no no you yeah, no, haven't missed much I haven't missed much okay I haven't seen the ads uh, well, I think it's so, going to be a long political season. I think so too. I mean, Peg Lautenschlager is out <clears throat> campaigning actively for her position as as um, attorney general, which I think is going to be a uh, difficult race. It's for going her. to be a difficult yeah. race for her. She has a difficult trial up north, presuming mm -hmm. that it stays up north. Uh, I would assume maybe with a different uh, jurors pulled from from uh, a different part of the state would seem to be a reasonable compromise. But uh, um, she's going to have some fairly tough competition. Um, is there a sense that there's going to be a primary on the Democratic side? Um, or I heard Falk's name being mentioned. Yeah, I did too. Yeah, I've heard that too. But I think a lot will depend on probably polling data that maybe will be started soon. You know, and then people will, prospective candidates will probably pay for mm -hmm. a poll. And uh, if the numbers look uh, promising, then they the, jump in. Yeah, on the Republican side, we have Paul Booker from uh, DA in Waukesha. Mm -hmm. Oh, any I any other Republicans? But Walker and Green. Are for, uh, for, this for Attorney for General. Oh, for Attorney General. I think there's another one. I can't name escapes me. Yeah. There's another attorney. I've seen, but yeah. So that's going to be an interesting race yeah. too. Um, Going back to the governor, I think his you know vetoing the uh, the ID bill is getting a lot of negative, getting him a lot of negative press. I think. The voter ID bill for voting. Well, I think the Democrats have to be just much more explicit about even being willing to acknowledge that there may be some problems, and just saying, if there are these problems, it's just real clear the photo ID bill does not no. solve those problems right. in any way, shape, or form. Right. Doyle actually has a fairly comprehensive plan, I think, yes. for voter reform. We've so we've talked you, about this before when you've yeah. got people waiting three hours to vote. Whether they have a photo on their ID or not doesn't solve the problem logistically. There's just they're un, most of these polling places are undermanned. They can't even get the people through the booths, let alone check authenticity of who's there. One of Doyle's, um, one of the pieces of Doyle's legislation to reform election fraud issues, is when people are registering at the polls, which would seem to be the place where felons might get in and vote, and they shouldn't be. That that as you register, you would check a box that says that, yes, you are a convicted felon or, or whatever, so that you go in at your peril knowing that if you check the box and vote, you're violating the law. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. so it seemed, to be, it seemed to be an interesting piece of it. But and just way off topic, but uh, yesterday, 
I think yesterday the Washington Supreme Court upheld the um, uh, Gregoire uh, victory uh, mm -hmm. as governor of Washington. Mm -hmm. And um, she actually went from having lost by 242 votes to winning by 129, and then I think they found another five in her favor. So these issues do become important, and uh, we haven't had anything quite that tight, except maybe for the Leibham Baumgart race. And uh, I don't think there were any allegations of fraud in that race, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, so it, it, it is interesting stuff. Um, the um, minimum wage, new minimum wage bill has gone into effect. Uh, we had started talking on a different show about um, Badger Care, uh, the medical assistance program that the state has at this point, being um, having grown enormously and uh, people d uh, are being used by people who have jobs at places like Walmart and McDonald's and other big employers that are not providing benefits. I think that's really uh, interesting stuff. Uh, there was a group in Sheboygan that for a while was examining not only an increase in the minimum wage, which I think is just up to, it's going up to 570 an hour, uh, the first of two increases, it'll go up to 650 an hour uh, as of June 1st, 2006. So in a, in a year from now, it'll be 650 an hour. Um, the living wage group here in Sheboygan estimated, and this is three, four years ago, that a living wage, in other words, a, a wage that would allow you to support your family in a very modest way, but without being on any government benefits, would be about $11 an hour if you don't have health insurance, about $9.50 an hour or so if you did have health insurance. Well, $6.50 an hour is not getting you there, nope. and, or even $7 or $8. <clears throat> Why such a struggle to, to have a, a minimum wage that's a little higher? Really, I mean, it hadn't increased in, what, years. 10, ten yeah. years? Yeah, see, I don't equate, well, I, I don't equate mm -hmm. uh, minimum wage with a living wage. Mm -hmm. So if you make that equation, well, I can't argue with you, but I don't equate it. I, oh, I, no, I, I think equate it with just a, you know, a, 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 star, a wage to give people an opportunity to learn some job skills, you know, uh, and it's minimal work. Well, I think it's just, it's a philosophical uh, debate. There are those who <coughs> say the free market system works, that uh, people will not work for something that's too low. You don't have to legislate that. Um, however, um, I come from a different school. I believe that uh, when there is a shortage of workers, um, you will see wages go up, but when there happens to be uh, lean economic times and there's a surplus of workers, there will be exploitation. Um, one of the things that has produced this country the way it is today is the growth of a middle class that it, for most of this history was, and Ken knows this as a history uh, uh, teacher, is that we've always had labor shortages. And when you have labor shortages, you can join unions and you can make demands and you can get benefits uh, that you wouldn't get and if there's a, a surplus. Um, country, third world countries today, um, you try to form a union, you'll be booted out, and you'll have 3,000 people outside the door looking for that same job tomorrow at whatever mm -hmm. uh, subsistent wage, of less than subsistent wage uh, is being paid. So I, I do think that uh, there should be a statement by government that there's, there is an absurd level ex of, uh, of exploitation that you can wreak out of your workers, and you shouldn't be doing that. Even though it isn't a living wage, uh, you ought not to be paying less than six bucks an hour because that's outrageously low. Right. And, and I don't equate living wage with minimum wage. I'm just saying that as we look, a minimum wage is clearly not enough to support a family uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But what we're seeing, I think, with workers who get more than, than a minimum wage but work in a place with no benefits, that actually does qualify them for something like Badger Care or food stamps or right energy assistance, again, depending, all these programs have different eligibility qualifications and so forth. But I think um, uh, it's, it's just been a, an interesting point to me, particularly since relatively few workers, to be honest, are paid so little um, that the, it has been such a struggle for such a long time that you actually have city councils where I think politically it's a whole lot more dangerous, wouldn't you agree? To, to institute a citywide minimum wage. Mm -hmm. well, that's what I was going to ask, uh, you know, with the 
compromise was to make it a state minimum wage and therefore all the, uh, the preemptions. Yes, the, the city of uh, Madison, who else? Milwaukee. Milwaukee. La Crosse, Eau Claire. Jamesville, all those have become, yeah. they get wiped off, uh, wiped off the books if that yeah. kind of will turn some of Doyle's supporters off for him agreeing to that sort of thing. Yeah. I don't think, <laughs> I, my sense is no, just in, because a minimum wage to me is a state issue. That's not something that individual city councils and county boards ought to be legislating. Uh, it's a, and they were doing so primarily because the state wasn't taking right. any kind of action whatsoever. Exactly. What they, the kind of action they thought the state government ought to be taking. Yeah. And you know, you, otherwise you end up with pockets of you know, higher labor costs and then how do these, these, these areas, these cities become economically competitive or stay competitive when just across the county line uh, it's tough enough you know, having states uh, having a race down to the bottom, trying to maintain businesses and giving uh, companies tax breaks to keep them uh, here and providing jobs. You know, county differences would be just horrendous. It yeah. seems to me. Yeah, I think that uniformity is is uh, is uh, is pretty important. So, speaking of the legislature, um, an interesting legislative proposal floated, uh, and I, I'm not sure I have all the details correct. Um, by, uh, and I forget the gentleman's name, uh, to ban stem cell research. Oh, Senator Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald, an Irishman of all things, um, uh, introduced a, a measure uh, in. Um, well, he's chairman, co-chairman of the finance committee. So, and, and it would go into the budget bill. I, I believe so because he has backed off from that amendment and said he's going to pursue it as individual legislation. And uh, the governor in his budget bill had, I believe, $360 million for the development of stem cell research sort of facility uh, in the, at the University of Wisconsin, which is one of the places where this whole issue began. And uh, he feels very strongly we ought to use the university as a stellar research facility uh, institution that it is and play on our, our strong points, which I, I agree with him wholeheartedly. And I think uh, this one in senator is, it just shows that uh, people who are in elective office doesn't mean they know a lot uh, about what they're talking about uh, sometimes. And as a result, I think he was um, off base in his, his prohibition. Well, we started to have a lively discussion before we went on the air, as a matter of fact, about whether the University of Wisconsin should even be um, an economic center, uh, a, a recipient of research monies uh, instead of private sector entities to do things like stem cell research. Um, the, one of the founders or one of the inventors or discoverers of stem cell research, uh, uh, being a professor at the University of Wisconsin um, uh, and quite prestigious, it makes sense to me that if we're talking about a brain drain in Wisconsin, as we seem to be, that our college educated kids leave, is that if we can create um, a research environment that really pays pretty well, brings in business to the state, it, it seems to be a win-win. Well, I think you play off your strengths and, you know, we're not a warm weather destination. We're not uh, mineral weight rich or oil rich. Uh, but what are we rich in? We're rich Stem in cells. <laughs> we're rich, we're rich in uh, the technical college system, the university system, K-12 education. Those are our strong points. We've Kids do well. Um, kids who come out of a, these higher institutions uh, do well. Uh, they're in demand all over the country. Um, when you look at that, it stares you in the face and say, well, like, maybe that's where we ought to be uh, putting our support. And the governor asked for $40 million more for the university. The finance committee cut it back to nine. And they called this university a greedy bunch of whatever um, eating at the public trough. I think, uh, again, some of these uh, empty-headed senators and, and representatives who are saying that are, are just are, are outrageous because uh, that university is the third largest public uh, university recipient of private dollars for research. Well, if you've got that type of confidence in the private sector that they'll come and give your 
your I faculty, know. your, your yeah. university money to do research, which then builds <coughs> labs and provides our students with state-of-the-art, uh, not only tutors because they're working with these people, but job opportunities after they get out of school. I mean, this is a totally a win-win situation. Uh, the, and the, the moral issue is the embryonic stem cell research. I don't think stem cell research uh, but you know, is is an issue. But uh, but the university budget is becoming an issue. It's it always, always with these conservatives that somehow the governor asking for forty million more. Well, if you want to keep good professors and you want to replace these folks, you got to come up with more money. It's going to cost you more money, more money this two years than it did the last two years, um, just by pay raises and cost mm -hmm. of medical benefits, cost of meeting uh, twenty six campuses. I mean, I can just envision. And Forty million dollars probably is a stretching uh, the budget uh, I know, compared I, to what what they need. I recall four or five years ago when I was at a regents meeting, they talked about a business professor who re retired. He was making like a hundred thousand dollars, ninety thousand dollars. Oh, you got this professor retiring now. You're going to be able to have a little savings to hire a new business professor, brand new would have been about 130,000 plus sure. perks yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. at the university. So it wasn't like you were saving money because your $100,000 professor retired. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to pay more plus perks because other institutions in other states will do that. I don't know how these the, how the cuts have played out here at the center, but I've had a couple of opportunities to talk to some folks at UW Oshkosh and over at um, UW Eau Claire. And in, in the case of Osh, one of the Oshkosh economics professors, who's a good friend of mine, was saying, they don't have the funding right now to offer the courses to get students to the degrees that they want. So they take some five or six years, which in, events, which yeah. in essence costs the taxpayers more money because they have to now yeah. put forward So here more you have a large, I mean, their economics yeah. department is yeah. growing out at Oshkosh, and, and they've got these students who are chomping at the bit to want degrees in economics, and they don't have, they don't have the uh, staffing capability to get these kids through in, in four years. I do need to correct something. I did say $100,000, you know, and I don't want the public to think that all professors get paid $100,000. I was going to talk to you. Right? <laughs> I think, you know, I, I'm just, uh, just wondering, uh, you yeah, know. Uh, I, uh, I, uh, in the UW colleges, uh, which uh, we've got a solid bunch of professors with PhDs in a variety of areas, I bet we our median salary is about $50,000, $55,000. I mean, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, maybe even yeah. so. We're not making a hundred thousand dollars, and I I do read uh, letters to the editor and all those professors making those big bucks. Mm -hmm. It isn't the case. Yeah. We are part of the pension system, which I have to agree is a good system. Uh, so the benefits that go with teaching are are good. Although we're paying our way now, yeah. the, the Blue Cross and Blue Shield, etc. Mm -hmm. But I think that Cal's point about a good university system being a prime economic driver is completely correct. And it's, oh, yes. it, you know, paying money to, to generate money, um, it's, it really is fairly astonishing yeah. just in terms of the, of the kind of economic impact that the, that the university system does, does have on the state. So, and um, quality of life. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, there, if you take university hospital and clinics, if you look at uh, some of the noted uh, oncologists and cardiologists and dermatologists yeah. leading in the nation are people who are employed there. And there are people who retire to Florida, get sick, and come back to Wisconsin because they want their better medical care than they can get somewhere else. Um, so those are, you know, they're all spin-offs of a university, investment in a university. Investment. My, my kids graduated from the University of Wisconsin. They go to another state. Where, are you, where did you graduate from? They tell them. Uh, Madison and people are impressed because the yes. University of Wisconsin has a name in the nation. Just spinning off, getting back to the budget, um, the uh, it certainly is a difficult process. In past years, we have <coughs> gone weeks and weeks and months and months past the time that we need to to pass a budget. Is that going to happen this year? Do you think that is the the no, I don't think so. Because the, I, the, I think the there's houses more are of a homogeneity in that conservative legislature than in the past. Um, and for a number of years, we had a uh, oh, we, had, we had a Republican right. assembly and a right. Senate-controlled uh, uh, by Democrats. Are just battlegrounds. Right, and then of course you had a, on one case you had a Democratic uh, 
Senate, Republican House, and a Republican governor. Oh, right. And so yeah, yeah. when the documents would get bantered back and forth, of course, they'd sort of rip them apart and start over. And eventually it took to September or October. I don't think that's going to happen. I think you're, you're seeing already uh, a lot of strong support for just cutting and then throwing it on the governor's desk. Yeah. Including money for child care, yes. uh, which is an issue near and dear to my heart, having been on the board of and a smart local smart growth and a number of other yeah. very popular programs. Well, in the smart cutting smart growth now, when so many municipalities have spent a fair chunk of yeah. change yeah. actually doing this and building the relationships right. that they need, it well, just doesn't seem to be a real what's a real the issue thing. for cutting? I mean, the debt, right? The state, uh, the lack of dollars, isn't that the issue? The revenues that come in are well, coming in. That's how we spend in. our money. Uh, we, used to, we don't have the money to spend for these programs. Yeah. Well, we right? used to incarcerate 7,000 people. We now incarcerate 22,000 people. I mean, we've spent money in certain areas, and there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, isn't that a, the a constant good, issue? A good statesperson will sit down and, and look what your bottom line is. What level of services do we want to provide? K-12, university, and so And then you go out and you say, well, now how can we, through our revenue stream, raise the, the resources we need. And in many cases, Wisconsin has been very much out of tune as far as uh, fees, for example. Um, there was a good article, I don't know if it was a local paper, but what it costs you as a non-resident to hunt in Iowa and Illinois and Michigan and Michigan, Minnesota it was much higher than it is for an out-of-state person to hunt in Wisconsin. So while you know, we look at some of our fee structures and we, we think they're not uh, what as low as they should be, in many cases there are fees that other states have gone to to support their infrastructure and their service level that we do not even look at. And so I'm not saying, I'm saying that taxes and fees, there are reasonable levels and that's where a good statesman and a good politician will start looking at what, what, what can the traffic bear, what's fair and so on, and then try to raise their revenues. Now, there are some segments that say that while personal income taxes have risen <coughs> fairly dramatically as a percentage of income for Wisconsin residents, uh, tax levels have dropped just that dramatically for corporate mm -hmm. uh, interests, and that really the state has one of the lowest corporate income tax rates uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the country. And my sense, however, is that because the mantra, the, the holy grail is not only to re you just simply cannot talk about increasing taxes. You can't do that. And so if you, in a thoughtful way, look at who's paying what and saying, is there a different way to do that, my sense is that that becomes so politically unpopular and so difficult that we, we just don't look at those kinds of things. And so we talk about rating the transportation budget, mm -hmm. Play games know. with a budget that Game, get, yeah. gets you in deeper trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like raiding the tobacco settlement. I mean, oh, we just wholesale was, just was took that away, and people seem to forget about that. Yeah. And uh, so those are all tough issues. And again, probably glad that we're not in the seat of power trying to resolve all those issues. And uh, it's uh, been a pleasure, and the time always seems to go so fast. Thanks, and we'll, we'll meet and talk some more.